Thank you so much for staying tuned. Now, since time in memorial, different organizations have been pushing for access to education for the girl child. Tonight, we focus on that by narrowing down a project done by Action Aid Kenya in a period of three years on tackling the barriers to girl child education. The project specifically aims to enable over 2,000 girls to challenge violence and overcome the barriers that prevent them from achieving their potential with a focus on the female genital mutilation, FGM. We talked to Susan Otieno, the Interim Action Aid Kenya Direct Executive Director, and interrogated some of those issues. Listen in. Right. Thank you, Susan Otieno, for making time. Let us now focus on the report that you recently launched, uh, that a survey that you, you had done for a period of time in eight counties concerning the girl child education. Could, if you could kindly elaborate, what, what are some of the findings that you found out in that particular research? Yeah, thank you. Um, Action Aid for a number of years has been working uh, to empower women and girls. And uh, in the process, there were barriers that we found, actually I talk of multiple barriers mm -hmm. that hinder women and girls to uh, achieve the desired level of empowerment, to take control, to participate in decision making, to join in leadership, both political um, and local. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these barriers listed in many ways, you'll find that um, many of them narrow down to violence against women and girls. Mm -hmm. And coming down to the girls, we found out that um, what was hailed as culture, as custom, was also part of what is considered as violence yes. against women and girls. Mm -hmm. Hence, our focus on FGM. Then we, again, narrowed down on the counties at that time that we were working in. And out of around 16 of them, eight of them emerged to be counties that we needed to focus on. Uh, Baringo, um, uh, Kajiado, Garissa, Embu, Isiolo, uh, Migori, and um, with this then there was West Pokot not to forget and Taita Taveta, mm -hmm. and hence there was need for us to have um, a consolidated approach that was not only going to focus on the girls, but also on the community as well as duty bearers. Mm -hmm because we feel um, to end FGM, despite uh, having legislation in place, the anti-FGM act, despite having it in place, despite having the anti-FGM board in place, there was a um, massive responsibility that uh, is, was and is still expected from the community uh, structures. And hence, for us, that's where our keen interest came in. That as we empower the girls and empower the, the women to be able to fight this vice, we needed also to look at the community structures, which I would narrow down and say they are structures that are, are hailed under patriarchy, under custom, under religion. And so looking at FGM, we had the cultural leaders, we had the community elders, we have the, um, the religious leaders. All these are structures in the community that we felt if we designed our program and worked with them, as well as work with the duty bearers, then we could be pointing um, the fight to the right direction. What are some of the counties, in the eight counties, what are some of the counties that are lagging behind in terms of achieving um, girl child education, if you could point out some of the counties that are not really um, adhering to the call for education for the girl child? Um, main, main counties, um, uh, Garissa, counties like uh, Kajiado, West Pokot, um, Migori, and, and these are Isiolo as well in Baringo. Mm -hmm. These are counties that you find uh, this, the atrocity of FGM has been carved within culture and equally carved within religion. Mm -hmm. And uh, mainly for the northeastern counties, it's both culture and religion. So when you're um, approaching it from a cultural perspective, religion comes and takes over. 
when you approach it from a religious perspective, they also say we are a cultural community. Mm -hmm. And this is why we felt we need to go beyond that. And uh, hence, uh, the, focus, the, three, uh, the focus of the three faces brought on board um, the duty bearers. And this, if we, you look at it, when the president issued his directive in 2019, uh, and uh, a commitment that we must end FGM by 2022, he linked it to the community structures. He linked it to the community elders whom you can find in the religious leaders, you can find in there the cultural leaders. Mm -hmm. And so these particular communities are communities that are strong in culture and strong as well in embedding FGM within religion. Has there been any um, political goodwill? Because even as we talk about um, community structures, it is a political nation and political processes are what are, are the tools for change in a community. So will you say that leaders in some of these counties that are lagging behind have really shown political goodwill for change? I would say it's minimal and it's wanting. Because um, when you work with the communities, the message that they give you is that our political leaders could support us, but any statement that they make against FGM will actually be converted into votes. In that, if you support it, you gain more. If you denounce it, you lose. Because the next thing, it will be a decree either in a, in a, in a mosque or it will be a decree at, a culture, uh, at an elders meeting. Yeah. And these are the custodians of culture, custodians of um, so-called community laws, yeah. if I can say so. And if they then issue a decree against your candidacy simply because you are against anti-FGM, then you lose. And so most of the politicians have shied away from this conversation because it puts them against their own community. But for us as Action Aid, we are facing politicians and saying, you have a role to play. You have a role of being accountable to the community. And when we talk of community, we are talking of girls and the women. If we are saying FGM is a violation of human rights, then as a political leader, you have to uphold human rights, the rights of every citizen. It starts with the girls who are at risk of FGM. Yes. Of course, to put um, the discussion in quite a timely manner, we have had COVID-19 here in the country and some of the non-governmental organizations have come out to say that some of the strides that they have made, they have been forced to regress due to COVID-19 pandemic. As the um, action aid, looking at the program that you have done so far, would you say that you have faced some sort of challenges in terms of ensuring that the girl child education is advocated for, given that most girls have gone back home, some have been forced to early marriages, others are pregnant. So what are some of the challenges that you have faced in this era of COVID-19 pandemic? We've been working around stopping violence against girls in schools for years mm -hmm. because Action Aid has been in Kenya since 1972. Mm -hmm. And our experience has always led us to that conclusion that unless we deal with violence, unless the prohibitions that have been set in the legislations that are meant to tackle violence against women and girls are actually implemented, mm -hmm. then we still have a long way to go. And so this particular program was part of the realization of what Action Aid has always found out. Yeah. Uh, tackling barriers to girls' education mm -hmm. ideally was implemented um, the last three years. And this evaluation happened in 2019 mm -hmm. with the report being ready from 2019 towards the end of 2019, getting into 2020. Mm -hmm with the report being ready for uh, dissemination actually by March. Mm -hmm. But because of COVID, we could, uh, could not. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at COVID and the effects, first we're saying we had made gains because we knew where to find the girls. They were in school. We had encouraged girls to be in school. The community structures had been built in a way that they knew where to find the girls in school and at home. Mm -hmm. They knew the duty bearers and how to reach them. 
in the government offices or in any public forum. Mm -hmm. But come COVID-19 and Friday of 13th of March, a, decree, um, a restriction is issued to, to be able to curb the spread, yeah. which we support. Yeah. As a country, as a program, we support. One, the learning institutions and the social meetings were canceled. Hence, disseminating information, further engaging the girls became a challenge. What then it meant is that the women whom we work with within the social networks had to reach the girls through their families. It brought an awakening to us that uh, we continue strengthening not only the girls, but also the parents, mm -hmm. their parental responsibility. So our programs also moved to that level. Mm -hmm. But they were affected because one, Movement mm -hmm. became a challenge. Mm -hmm. Group meetings became a challenge. Government offices were closed. If you are to push for accountability and the government offices are closed, then you cannot reach the duty bearers. Mm -hmm. The other challenge was that the community was now prioritizing. If I was working and I was able to bring food home, or I'm a farmer and I was able to sell my produce, and now I cannot do that, what's my first priority? To be able to put food on the table. Mm -hmm. Priorities shifted. But as we do say that we do our programming around the community's priorities, we had to do a lot of reorientation. Number one, we made sure that there were still means and ways of the community getting information. We worked with radio programs, TV stations, to ensure that we continue passing the information. Number two, and the major one, is that Action Aid works in partnership with community institutions and the women and girls themselves. Mm -hmm. We made sure that their institutions continued to engage. Mm -hmm. But also, we ensured that we provided them with the safety kits. Mm -hmm. They could access masks, could access uh, sanitizers, they could access hand washing equipment for them to be able to keep safe as they met with the girls. Mm -hmm. And this, much as we had the losses, we also can count gains mm -hmm. because we continued reaching the families, reaching the girls, and even the duty bearers mm -hmm. to, to some extent. One of the challenges also that COVID-19 brought about was um, hospitals, shopping areas, and all that became areas of, um, I would call them fear. Mm -hmm. And uh, you find that we attach hospital to the um, health um, and if we are talking about our hospitals and we are talking about the health of the women and the girls, mm -hmm. now, remember FGM is also a threat to health. Mm -hmm. Remember women and girls are in the first place expected to be um, accessing um, better health care. Mm -hmm. And this is the other realization that we found. While we had worked with communities to engage with their counties to ensure that we are providing, uh, they are providing what we refer to as gender responsive public services. It still became a challenge. That number one, there is restriction, and there was also fear of COVID. Mm -hmm. And so even when we told the women, no, if a girl has gone through FGM or has faced violence, uh, please follow through the hospital, there was fear. And we feel there were losses on that line. That, um, the girls could not be safely secured. Um, but again, who wanted to leave their home knowing that when they go to hospital, there's infection? Yeah. What we capitalized on as Action Aid was to pass the right information. You cannot keep away from hospital, but you can go there observing the safety measures that had been put. Um, the biggest loss that we foresee, and it will manifest as the students start going back to school, is the girls' pregnancy, early pregnancy, child marriages, we are worried. Mm -hmm. Number one, it's unfortunate that the government systems don't have a mechanism that can actually document and track. So the girls who are confident to go for antenatal are the ones who are captured, mm -hmm. because you'll capture the age. Mm -hmm. How about the ones who cannot come out? Mm -hmm. Whose responsibility is it? to ensure that we track the students, not only when they're in school, but all through, in school, between school and home, and at home. And that's ideally for us as Action Aid, we know those are the three areas where violence could happen and affect even their education 
and livelihoods in the long run at home, on your way to school, and in school. So there is an accountability that is still needed. Mm -hmm. Who accounts for the students, and more so the girls, when they are home? Yes, there is parental responsibility, but there has to be another validation mechanism, which is now how the government should be able to utilize its own systems, mm -hmm. mechanisms, mm -hmm. yes, so to be able to track. So what are some of the interventions that you have done so far? I know that you've said that this is not a, a month's project. It is something that has been done for three years. And Action Aid has been here for quite a, a long period of time. So what are some of the interventions that you've put in place to ensure that there is change, that there is uh, advocacy and civic education in terms of cultural education? The use of media. We still continue to ensure that communities can access the right information. We can pass the right information. We link them to government facilities. We link them to uh, government officers for them to even hear directly from, from the government and to have the right information about COVID-19 mm -hmm. and how it spreads and how we can prevent it. That's the first one. Mm -hmm. But number two, we also encourage them. You have to take care of your own safety. I mentioned that Action Aid works in partnership with communities and their institutions. Yeah. And that made it very easy for us because if we had distributions to make, all we had to ensure is that in a healthy way, they, they reach the community and the community is able to distribute. In a way, we would ensure that the women are able to plan and coordinate and organize themselves in their own groups, in their own networks, to reach out to the girls in school and still talk to them. So you may fail to meet them, in not in school at home, you may fail to meet them in school, but they had a mechanism. They allocated themselves a number of girls and continued engaging with the parents as well as the girls. Within what we distributed, one of the things that we made sure was in there was um, dignity kits, just to make sure that the girls can access a dignity kit. Then, because most of the times you find one of the reasons that you find a girl engaging in early sex is probably to secure some of the needs. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, given that COVID-19 affected the economy, it also affected for household income. So uh, making them, enabling them to access, and remember while in school they accessed sanitary pads. Mm -hmm. Your periods don't stop because you're home because of COVID, yeah? <laughs> it's, like, it's not like your exercise book it will not be filled up because your teacher is not teaching. With your periods, they come, whether you're in school or not. Mm -hmm. Now, we found a lapse on that, in that area, that uh, the girls could not access the dignity kids. And so we made sure that it was part was, of what was being provided. But this is just what Action Aid could do. How about the other organizations? So we still encourage partnerships. Yeah, coordination mechanisms, that's one thing that we also look into during an emergency like this, is that uh, we've built the local institutions to be able to coordinate amongst themselves, to be able to reach out for accountability. Because if we do not also check with the government to be accountable on the resources, then we can only do what is within our remit and the rest remains undone. And uh, for us, we've built community-led uh, processes, including engaging with the county government, seeking out to know what were the budgetary allocations, how has it been uh, utilized. So the citizen themselves, citizen, I would call them citizen-led processes. They are able to engage. But with COVID, the main reason would be offices are either closed or staff are working from home. And that's why I would attribute also that to the massive corruption that we saw, yeah. especially in areas where we, we work, mm -hmm. that the communities could not reach out to, to the government to query, to question. And it's always been an assumption that uh, during an emergency, you take what comes, just you take it as it comes. For us, we say no. The community knows uh, the answers to the questions that they have. To the, they know the solutions. All you need to do is to give them the leadership and enable them, and they will do it with you. And that's why we are promoting a lot of public participation. Mm -hmm. Involve them when you're planning. They will work with you to distribute. They will work with you on the accountability. This is an area that we still feel 
uh, the government should reinforce, not only during, during development work, but also during uh, emergency mm. interventions. You mentioned that since 1972, you have had cases of violence when it comes to women and girls. And now that you're in the year 2020, will you say that you've made progress? Will you say you're uh, stagnating? Will you say that you're moving backward in terms of ensuring that the girl child education is advocated for not only by the government, but even the community leaders get quite to understand the essence of educating the girl child? Are we making progress so far? As, as a country, we've made progress, COVID or no COVID. Number one, their legislations that uh, guide prevention against um, um, domestic violence. It's an act. All we need to see is um, implementation that targets the right quarters, all the way from judiciary, and even uh, operationalizing them into policies, etc. The anti-FGM act is there. Uh, we've made progress. We have the legislation. But what we are saying is execution and implementation and follow-up. Because uh, if I relate this to FGM, if I'm a co part of the community structure and FGM is still happening, the big question is, if I'm a local leader, I'm attached to the provincial administration, what was my role? And if I fail as a part of the provincial administration, then the government is failing in reinforcing and ensuring that action is taken. And that is why I, I still want to go back to the presidential uh, commitment. Mm -hmm. If it was made and the elders have committed, the government still has a duty to follow and ensure that the community elders are actually executing it without excuse, because we are executing part of a legislation. It's not a story. We are saying it is wrong, it's a vice, FGM is, is um, a breach. I mean, it's a human rights issue. It is criminal, I would just, if I lack a better word, I would just say it's, it's, it's a crime against humanity. So why would we be negotiating on enforcement of legislation? The other area that I see, uh, we've made progress in terms of uh, there are certain issues that we've been able to make them national issues. When, for instance, ActionAid was very, very keen on having children go to school. We worked with communities. Uh, when you look at the ECD program, when it was being um, uh, uh, rolled out into the entire country, ActionAid was very, very keen to ensure that we support setups of ECD, the training of the teachers. Uh, ensuring that we encourage parents to, to take their children to school. Then came uh, His Excellency retired president, uh, Mwai Kibaki. It was a decree and it happened and we saw influx of children in school. So if we are committed, as Action Aid we've seen, that when the executive is committed, it is easy to translate into great success. So yes, the country has made progress. The way the president took it up, just as the retired president also took up the universal education, universal primary education, it should be the case with FGM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we shouldn't say 2022 and leave it without mechanisms, without structures and systems to ensure that it happens. That requires concerted um, efforts. It Susan, um, kindly tell us, what are some of the hurdles or the challenges that you've faced in terms of advocating for change? Of course, some of these cultural and religious beliefs have been with the community for a long period of time, and therefore advocating for change will be quite a hurdle and a challenge. So what are some of the challenges that you've faced in terms of policies in place, in terms of beliefs and the be behavioral uh, uh, um, approach of the community leaders and also parents and children at large, what would you say has been the hurdle that has made it quite impossible to make huge strides in terms of advocating for change? Um, I think um, when we look at um, the fight against uh, female genital mutilation, if it's well positioned, as I said, there's legislation, but uh, who 
is in charge and who is ensuring that we are tracking to see the success. If it's not happening, then another question should be asked. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, number one, the legislation is there. Let's ensure it is tracked. If there's gap in implementation, we have stakeholders who are really interested in working with everyone. Number two, the girls themselves have an interest in education. How do we ensure that they can access education? We still have girls in places where they walk long distances and safe roads just trying to access education. We still have the challenge of unpaid care work and burden of care that still devolves on the girls and the, and, and the women. And hence, it is easier to determine that a girl should stop going to school, go for circumcision, get married, you know, it's easier for that decision to be made. Why? Because the burden of care is borne by them. But if this is well distributed, then the girl first would have time and the community will appreciate that keeping a girl longer in, sc in, in school longer than they're, what they're doing now guarantees a better life. So the main challenge is for the community to project this into the future of the girl. So far, in most of the areas, the girl's future is limited to success being defined as marriage, you know, and marriage means FGM, then marriage, and that's it, nothing else. So this has to be redefined. The burden of care has to be redefined and redistributed. And the, most of the ways of doing this is just to ensure that the budgetary allocations go into areas that will be reducing the burden of care for the women. How is the health system? so that I'm not a caregiver 24-7 for somebody who could have accessed good health and improved. How, where is water? So that I don't do a 20 kilometers to get water, yet I can wake up in the morning, do a, maybe 500 meters, or find the water in the, in the compound, and then go to school. Okay? So these are some of the, the distribution that we're talking about. Look into the unpaid care work that has always been tagged on women, and how, is, is the government even appreciating that? for them to start saying, then we need to budget. Yes. All right, thank you so much, Susan Otieno, for making time and conversing issues concerning the girl child education. Of course, even in your clarion call that government institution and the public should be on the lookout to ensure that they advocate for change when it comes to girl child education.